is it started a server. And here's our URL. And now what we need to do is to get the target to click on that URL. By clicking on a link, you've basically given them permission to take control of your system. Hey everyone, Yaniv Hoffman here, back with another video and back with a channel uh, favorite. Welcome, Occupy the Web. Thank you, Yaniv. It's always great to be here. Likewise, and my honor. And if you are not familiar with Occupy uh, the Web, we did a bunch of uh, videos, many subjects. So I will leave the description in this uh, video, so check them out. But Occupy the Web is also the author of this uh, book, Linux Basic for Hacker, which is a fantastic uh, book for everyone who wants to, to learn operating a system, especially Linux and start his path in hacking. So we leave also link for, for that. And don't forget, we have also 20% discount in Hackers Arise uh, website, the community of uh, Occupy uh, the Web. The coupon name is Yaniv, Y-A-N-I-V. So please check it out. It's great uh, deal, a great opportunity. So please leverage that. With that said, Occupy the Web, I think I exposed a bit of what we are going uh, to speak about, but maybe you will now take it uh, forward and we'll dive in. Yeah, so well, what, what I'd like to talk about a little bit today is kind of do an introduction to Metasploit. And, and Metasploit is a framework that has been around for a long time for hacking. And so it's, when we say framework, it's just like, it's a set of tools. It's a way of doing things like reconnaissance and exploitation. It has a set of, of payloads that payloads in, in Metasploit terms mean something that you leave behind on the attack system. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to talk a little bit about Metasploit and show you a little bit about how it works. I have a book if people who want to know more about Metasploit. I have a book called Metasploit Basics for Hackers. It's so I've got my Kali here. This is uh what do I got? Kali 2.2024. So that's about a year old. Okay, as you can see, I've got a terminal open in Metasploit 2024. And it's not if you're using an older version or a newer version, it really isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. Okay, it's going it's going to work very similarly. Okay, or almost identically. It's been Metasploit uh, for since about 2018. Metasploit goes back about 20 years, but but since 2018, it's pretty much worked the same with very small improvements taking place. So anything since 2018 is going to work very similarly. Now, if you're in Kali, okay, you can get to Metasploit a couple of ways. Right? You can go up here to the term, up to the, the, the menu, and you can go to exploitation tools, and there's a Metasploit framework there, and you can click on it. Or, more simply, you can just go MSF console, right? And that'll start Metasploit from there. And, but you know, either way, if you want to use the menu or if you want to use the command line, it works the same. Metasploit was designed to put the known exploits, the known payloads, some of the scanning tools, okay, and some of the tools for creating exploits all into a single frame. It's free and open source. It's been around for about 20 years. You can see that. This is Metasploit 6.2.26. And I also want to point out that every time you open Metasploit, it comes up with a little slightly different splash. So if you get something different, don't worry about it, right? In one of the splash screens says, you haven't entered your, your password. It's a joke. So it's a, don't worry about that if that comes up. I, I was one time teaching a class and one guy said to me, I can't use Metasploit because it comes up with a, but the splash screen says you haven't entered your password. All right. Well, that that's just that's 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 geek humor, right? <laughs> let's uh, let's take a look at what we have here. So you can see when it opens up. This is geek humor here too. I love shells. So it tells us what version it is right there. Now it also tells us how many of the different 
modules there are in Metasploit, right? So here you can see these are 2,264 exploits, commonly might be known as a hack. It's a way to get inside of a system. There's 2,264 in there. Some of them are old and some of them are new, all right? So it all depends, you know, depends upon the system that you're trying to attack, which one you're going to select, all right? So part of the being proficient at Metasploit is that first of all you need to know what system you're attacking and one of the things i always tell my people is that you need to do recon good recon first because if you don't do good recon you're not going to be successful right. the things that you need to know about the system that you're attacking at a minimum is you need to know what operating system it is and what version it is what applications and what services are running on it? What ports are open? Right? These are the things that you need to know first. Without knowing those things, you're not gonna have success. You're just gonna be you know, constantly throwing exploits at a system and not be successful, all right? So, and I also want to point out that sometimes there's confusion about what ports are open on a system and what services are running, okay? The ports represent a, a service behind it. You're not, you're not attacking the port, you're attacking the service behind it. Yeah. And when you do an Nmap scan, Nmap tells you the default service behind the open port. Sometimes you need to delve a little deeper to find more information. And remember, if you're using Nmap to do your recon, Use the A switch, the okay, dash uppercase A, and that will get you inside of the system. I'll just show you quickly what I'm talking about here. It's Nmap, okay, and then say dash ST, and then dash A, whoops, dash A, like that. And what that does is it goes inside the system and tells you what service is actually running, all right? Right. Now, one of the things you need to do before you get to Metasploit is to have, is to have done that kind of recon, knowing what the operating system is, what applications are running on it, what services. From there, you can determine what exploit might work, okay, might work. And then these are the exploits. So in common parlance, this might be what people would call a hack, okay? Mm -hmm. Now. Here we have 1,189 auxiliary modules. Auxiliary modules are all the things in Metasploit that are not exploits, okay? Are not posts, not payloads, not encoders, and not NOPs, and not, ev not, not evasion modules. So this includes a lot of reconnaissance modules. Sometimes some brute force password cracking are in there, but it basically is a catch-all for everything that doesn't fit into the other categories. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Some of them are come close to become, being an exploit. Things like, you know, a password cracker, you know, would depend upon how you perceive it. In Metasploit, it's seen as an auxiliary module. Mm -hmm. Over here, we have 404 post modules. Oh, a post module is post exploitation okay so that means after i've cracked open i hacked the system okay so the way i like to think about this process is that the exploit cracks open the system think of it as maybe you know if we have a, a, a secure home and I'm trying to get inside of it right, right. The, ex the exploit might crack open the window or crack open the door right and then the post is what we do after we've gotten inside post exploitation right now we have 951 payloads 951 payloads so that a payload and once again in metasports terms means what we leave in the house okay that allows us to go in access it whenever we want to so it's one thing to get inside, but you want to keep on coming back, right? You want to keep on coming back. And the payload allows you to connect 
into the house, okay, and do what you want, largely with post-exploitation modules, right? So a post-exploitation module might be something like a key logger or a, uh, a turn on the webcam, right? These are things you do after the exploitation and they use, okay, they work inside or in association with the payloads to allow you to do those things, right? right. So payloads are what some people might call a listener or a shell code, okay? Shell code would be a payload. Then we have 45 encoders. These are ways that I can take my uh, payload and, and encode it in different language or different encoding mechanism. Sometimes that's useful to get past, or at least it used to be really useful to get past some of the AV, less viable in 2024 than it used to be. But sometimes you have to re-encode a payload to work in different types of environments. Right? If you have a, a, a PHP environment, you're going to have to go ahead and encode the payload into PHP. Right? You, you, can't, you can't use a Python shell code in a PHP environment. You would have to convert it into PHP. And that's what these encoders do. 11 NOPs, okay? If you're not familiar with the term NOP, it stands for No Operations, okay? It's a way to, to create a buffer overflow. So most of the times when we're doing remote code execution, RCE, remote code execution, those are the really powerful acts. Right? A remote code execution allows us to run our own code on the target system. It involves a buffer overflow. And that's what these are for, is helping to develop an exploit, okay, for a buffer overflow, all right? And then we have nine evasion modules. These, came, these started coming out in 2018 with version five. And these are modules that allow us to hopefully get past any antivirus detection, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the different types of modules that uh, are available to us. If you want to see those modules, right, you can go, okay, so you can use the show command. Okay, show is one of those key words that you need to work in, in Metasploit. And if I wanted to say, look at the payloads, I could just go show payloads, all right? And there they are. You can see all the different types of payloads. I'm gonna try to open, make this little wider so you can see better. And there's a lot of payloads, almost a thousand different payloads, okay? And you can see there's a, each one of their directories explains kind of what they are. So this payload works on Windows systems that are x64 and it creates a PowerShell reverse TCP. What that means is that it uses PowerShell to connect back to you. Okay, it sends out a connection to your system so that you can control the target system. So it's important to, once again, even with the payload, that you need to have the payload to be compatible with the environment that you're attacking. If you're attacking an X64 system, then you need an X64. Here you can see that this one here is payload Windows X64, so 64-bit meterpreter uh, reverse TCP. So this raises a question. What is a meterpreter? Well, the meterpreter is a special type of payload that was developed by Metasploit that allows, gives you more power over the target system. It allows you to do more things mm -hmm. than you could if you just got like a command shell on the system. So if you can get the meterpreter on the system, all the better. That's great. Okay, so these, there's a thousand different, you can choose different payloads for different environments. Okay. This one here, for instance, is a Win VNC server. Okay, so, so we can go ahead and, and put in a GUI VNC payload so we can actually use the Windows GUI 
on the system that we give a tax, all right? right? So show is one of those keywords, right? Probably that's one of those important words that we need to know to be able to work effectively in Metasploit. The next keyword is search, all right? So this is really important. So if you're gonna use Metasploit effectively rather than, you know, you know, you're actually going to use it in an environment where you're trying to attack and take control of a remote system. You got to find the right exploit, right? You have to find the right exploit. So this search command becomes kind of key, right? And so one of the things that you want to do with the search command is you want to tell it what type of module are you looking for? And you can go type, right? and then go, I want a window. I want to attack a window system, right? I'm sorry, Whew. I want an exploit, <laughs> my bad, okay? Exploit, so I want an exploit, okay? Not a payload, okay? Not a NOP, not a post. I want an exploit. That's usually the place we start, okay? And then we can tell it what platform we want, all right? So we go platform and go with Windows. All right. Platform is almost synonymous with operating system. It's not exactly because there are some things that are not operating system, but it's you're telling the system, you're telling Metasploit, what type of system are you attacking? All right. So let's say that we were looking for an exploit, okay, for Windows, and we wanted something that would attack say oh let's consider say maybe adobe right adobe oops gotta spell adobe right i do adobe like that so this will narrow my search down to exploits throws out all the other types of modules only those that'll work against windows and only those that'll work against adobe products okay we haven't gotten more specific than that so let's see what that comes up with Okay. Well, we got 55 of them. Look at that. Okay. We've got 55 products. Okay. 55 exploits that will work against Adobe products. Yeah. All right. Now, most of these you're going to see are going to be against Flash. Okay. Flash. Flash was a very, uh, very vulnerable application, huh? A very vulnerable <laughs> yeah. application, exactly. Here's another one, Adobe Flash, Adobe Flash, Adobe Flash, right? Adobe Flash was so vulnerable that um, they eventually discontinued it, right? And right. it was actually, it wasn't developed by Adobe. Adobe bought a company called Macromedia, and uh, Macromedia made uh, Adobe Flash that time it was Macromedia Flash, and, and uh, it had it was as much as Adobe tried to fix it. Okay, they never were able to get it to really. To I, be I think not, it made them the most vulnerable application in the world. Maybe I'm a bit I, wrong. One I, of the top. I ones. think. Huh? I think you're. I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. It it made it made any application that used Flash vulnerable. Right? Yeah. And so it was eventually Adobe kept on patching it and patching it and patching it. And eventually they gave up on it, right? They, uh, they said, this is, this, there's no, there's no fix for this, right? And they gave up on it and it's, uh, it's no longer being produced, right? Uh, probably for good, you know, it's good reason. And it's probably a wise move on their part, right? So this is, uh, these are all of those that we can, so if we were looking or something to attack Flash, right? here's or any Adobe product, because there's some of them that are not Flash in here. You'll see uh, like PDF uh, tools in here. Here's Adobe Reader right here, and others. Here's PDF right here. Uh, an embedded EXE, okay, in an older version of of uh, Adobe Reader, okay. So this is the way we go and find what we're looking for to be able to attack the system. So 
One of the things that I, I probably should have showed first is how to get help, right? That's always a good place to start. Right? Yeah. So let's do that right now, help, right? And here's here's our help screen for Metasploit. All right, let's go back all the way up to the top. There's a lot here, all right? So here we can just use the question mark to get the help menu, same as typing help. We can use the CD to change the current working directory or display the awesome Metasploit banner, all right? And you can kind of see some of the others. Some of the key words here that you want to know is, of course, exit to get out, okay? Help to get help, all right? Quit to exit the console. That is a key word, okay? Sessions. So sessions in the terminology of Metasploit, session is whenever you've created a connection to your target. You've created a connection to your target, you're inside that target and you're connected to it. That's a session. So if I wanna see my sessions, there's the key word there, sessions, all right? Sleep, set, okay? Set is, and also one of those, I think you can be effective in Metasploit with about six or eight keywords and sets one of them. Set is where you go ahead and set a variable like an IP address, right? That you want to attack. Right. Yeah, and then this one here is really important, use. So yeah. use is what we, when we want to use a module, we use the keyword use and then the name of the module. I've already shown you show and search, all right? Also options is key and info, okay? So, and then we can see there's there's others here as well, but let's start with, let's start with the simple, all right? And then we can, maybe in future videos, we can do more, all right? One of the things that you can do, okay? So here's, it's showing you some examples down below here. And I'm gonna go ahead in next. So we've gone ahead and we've been able to use the show command. We've gone, use the, effectively use the search command, All right? And let's go ahead and once again, find, All right, an exploit. <laughs> type exploits late in the day early for you late for me okay platform <laughs> platform windows and then adobe okay and so let's see we've got a lot of them here let's let's go through and take a look at some of them that are available to us all right and Here's one here, flash shader job. Notice that it highlights the word Adobe, the words yes. that we're looking for, right? And we've got a for, lot. For the of... newcomers, uh, Occupy the Web, for the new newbies, uh, what does it mean, the, the text on the right, great or normal? Ah, good question. Yeah, good, good question. So what that means is that it tells you how successful this exploit is, right? So one of the things that people who are new to hacking don't know is that an exploit doesn't always work. Even one that's been tried and true for maybe for years or decades. So this is indicating how successful it is. Is it gonna work most of the time? Yeah, this one's gonna work most of the time. Normal means it might work like 50% of the time, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that you want are the ones that are great right. if you if if or excellent like this one here right excellent so this is kind of it's kind of an important point because people you know they watch a they watch a youtube video or they watch a tiktok video and it always works it always works in the tiktok video right but in reality in reality it doesn't always work right and you know this can be kind of deceiving because you know somebody who's starting out they go well it worked for you know in that TikTok video but it's not working for me why right well 
it might just have to keep on trying it or it might be that the target is not exactly what you think it is right so but even if you do there's a chance that it's going to fail right so that's why you know you really need to have good okay reconnaissance to know if it's going to actually work on that system all right so let's pick out one of these here you know and of course you know you can find just a i'm just gonna do one more search to kind of show the, the viewers you know say i was looking for search and i went to platform and went windows and no. yeah I can, it doesn't matter what order it's in okay yeah. then i can go type okay exploit okay uh and then i went say eternal eternal blue all right eternal blue was a exploit that was developed in 2016 2017 by the national security agency of the u.s um, for basically allowing them to hack into just about any system right and you see there's multiple versions here you can see it's 2017 and it has an interesting story and it's an interesting study in exploits because one, it was developed by the NSA. Okay. Two, it was stolen from the stolen NSA by the Russians. By, yes. by the Russians, exactly. And then the Russians released it to the public, and then it was used by multiple cyber gangs, cyber criminal gangs, to exploit systems, particularly in ransomware. There was ransomware attacks, you know, throughout 2017 using Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue cracked open the system, allowed the ransomware inside, right? And yeah. then they would encrypt all of the files and then you'd have to pay for yeah. them. Right? Remote code execution. Maybe. Remote right. code execution, exactly. So here's, here's several of them that are available to you in Metasploit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, these are basically reverse engineered exploits. So what people did is that they took the original exploits that the NSA developed and then basically wrote them to do the same thing. And I go into great depth in my book getting started becoming a master hacker on eternal blue as a matter of fact we do kind of a a study on it so we look at how it operates we look at what it looks like from wireshark perspective we look at the python reverse engineered code okay to get some idea of how it works which by the way we have a reverse engineering course coming up in, in uh, a couple weeks at hackers horizon Reverse engineering is a is sometimes an underappreciated field within hacking. And what it does is that it allows you to take, say, some malware and tear it apart to understand how it works. And almost all of the hacking gangs, the criminal hacking gangs and all the intelligence community all do reverse engineering. Why? Because they'll take known malware and then repurpose it they'll make some changes to it so first thing they'll do is they'll take the malware they'll open it up they'll look around inside try to understand how it works and then go ahead and then repurpose it for something else make some changes to it and probably one of the best the best examples of that was black energy that was used against ukraine's energy grid it was actually Black Energy 3. It was on its third iteration of being re-engineered. So, but whether it be the CIA, the NSA, uh, Sandworm, the Unit A200, they all re-engineer malware. So that's part of what we'll be doing in this upcoming class. But if you want to know more about Eternal Blue, my book, Getting Started to Become a Master Hacker, we look closely at it. All right, so this is it's built into Metasploit now. It works it works good against Windows Seven, Windows Eight, and some Windows Ten systems. Right, some Windows Ten systems. Um, so and it you know an unpatched these are all unpatched. It'll work against unpatched systems. 
right? So that's how we find what we're looking for. Let's go ahead now and look at one particular exploit, right? We'll go exploit, right? And then we'll go Windows. And we'll look at the uh, browser. We're just, I'm just picking out one of the many Adobe Flash um, exploits. And we'll load it into RAM, AVM2, all right? And we'll load it up. Okay. And you can see the message it comes back with. It says, no payload configured. So mm -hmm. it's going to default to the Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP. What this means is that it's using, obviously, a Windows Meterpreter. It's going to use the Metasploit Meterpreter, which is basically a shell code that has some additional capabilities. And it's going to be reverse, which means that it's going to call back to you using TCP. Okay, that's what that is there. Mm -hmm. So once we have this loaded, right, we probably want to go ahead and find some more information about it. Let's go info, all right? And you see this module exploits a vulnerability found in the ActiveX component of Adobe Flash Player. By supplying a specially crafted SWF file, it's possible to trigger an integer underflow in certain AVM2 instructions. It shows us all of the different platforms that'll work. It looks like Windows 7 and Windows 8. Okay. And it includes the CVEs, so you can know. And that includes this exactly. So here, if you want to learn more about this particular exploit, you, know, you can go ahead and look at these here, right? Um, and, and learn more about it, right? And how it works and what the vulnerability is, right? And up above, we can look at it and this shows us an Adobe Flash Player Integer Underflow Remote Code Execution. Notice that, remote code execution. Those are the ones that we really want because they are going to allow us to run our code inside somebody else's system, right? Tells us the platform is Windows. Now, this tells us here privilege. This means that we're going to come in to the target system as an unprivileged user. That means as a regular user. And that's you know, oftentimes the way that we have to get in. It's nice if we can get in as an admin, right? Or a root user, system admin, that'd be ideal. But we always, we can't always. Sometimes we have to get in as a regular user and then do privilege escalation. Privilege escalation is a whole art in itself of trying to go from a regular user, okay, to a privileged user, right? right? So the first thing is we want to go ahead and we want to get inside the system, right? And so here's an example of what we would do is that this essentially creates a, a server, all right, and a URL right. so that you then would send to the target and then when they click on the URL, it puts the payload, okay, the shell code, onto their system. That, that yeah. shell code calls back to you and gives you a connection inside their system. All right? That's what's going on here. So we can go and ahead. See the 8080s, HTTP. You spoke about port and services. So 8080, port 8080 mm -hmm. represents HTTP service. Right. Well, you can run HTTP on any port. Right? Yes. So, so this is this is running on 8080, which is often used by some organizations to obscure where they're running their HTTP. This is to basically to make sure that it's not interfering with your port 80. Right. right. And this right. means server host right here. Okay. If you leave it at 000, that means that anybody can connect to it. The local host or network interface to listen on, right? This yeah. must be an address on the local machine or 000 to listen on all addresses, right? Yes. So that's probably the best way to do it is to leave it so that it listens on all addresses, right? Okay, this is the I, have, I have a question. So, so we yeah. do. 
interrupt you. Yeah, no problem. I see SSL is uh, false, and today in uh, HTTP2, almost the entire internet is encrypted. Right. So what does it mean? So most, most probably this will fail because may, probably the, the site today or the server speaks only SSL? Well, what this will do, okay, is that it says false here. So yeah. it's not going to run SSL. So if your browser is, some cases, the browser will warn you and say, this, there's no, mm -hmm. you know, there's no SSL here. So this might be one of those things that's going to tip off the user that, you know, there's, this is not, there's no SSL. Now, what we can do, of course, okay, is that we can change the SSL to true, right? Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't tip them off. Right, so we can go set, all right? Set that's the command to set, okay? Set SSL. You see that's the name of the variable, SSL yeah. to true. All right. It says it says changing the SSL options value may require changing the R port. Okay. So let's do show options. Maybe four four three. Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, yeah, we could change it to 443 or you know once again this is mm. remember this is going to create a url that somebody's going to click on what wow. we're determining here is what port we are listening on Listen. right yeah True. so what port they're going to connect to right so we might want to change this okay to say set okay our port okay to 443 right so like that okay yeah. i'm sorry mm -hmm. um set server port okay to 443 right like that there mm -hmm. we go Change. now show options right and so here we go you can see what is done is it's it's gone ahead and changed the server port to 443 mm -hmm. And now it's going to be SSL. So this right. means that for the target, when they click on the link we're going to send them, right, that it's not going to necessarily uh, set off any alarms that it's not SSL. Right? So we've made some small changes here. right? Mm -hmm. And then this over here is the payload options. So we have an exit function, we have an L host, and we have an L port, okay? This is, we can change this to any port to call back to us, all right? This is, what port is this going, is this payload gonna call back? Remember, this is a reverse TCP, okay? Right. And so we can change that to whatever we want, but let's just leave it there. It's not gonna really make a whole lot of difference, okay? Unless, of course, that port happens to be one that is blocked by a firewall. In which case, mm -hmm. this goes to our recon. You might want to go ahead and do recon on the firewall to see what ports are open because if it's blocking those ports, then you're not going to be able to call back. So you're going to want to pick a port that's open, right? That you can call back to. So we've got it pretty well set up. And now all we need to do is go exploit and start a reverse tcp handler okay so what this has done okay here we go is it started a server and here's our url right and now what we need to do is to get the target to click on that url and once they click on it it'll then give us a session inside their system so if you've ever wondered if you've ever wondered you know the why or how all those phishing emails have click here <laughs> or those <laughs> those those text messages you get that say click here you wonder what why they have that this is what they're doing right they basically have created a exploit that will take advantage of your system once you click on any type of link you don't have a whole lot of protection. It's going to take over your system. By clicking on a link, you've basically given them permission to take control of your system. 
And that's what this is here. We've basically created a link, okay? If we can get the victim to click on that link, we will take control. Of course, it also is dependent upon certain conditions, like they have Adobe Flash on their system and they're yeah. using a browser with Adobe Flash on it. We take control of their system, okay? So, so we're just copying, just copying this link now, putting it like in a phishing in, uh, email exactly. or something. Exactly. Let's say someone click and is probably exploded. Exactly. That's the idea is that you've created. And there's a lot of these different links that are built into Metasploit that you can create and then send them off to attach to an email or a, uh, a text message and then once they go ahead and open that up, then you have control over their system. I think that this particular uh, attack was developed by a hacking team, and that kind of raises another issue. We talked about Eternal Blue and how Eternal Blue was developed by, it wasn't actually developed by NSA, it was developed by a contractor to the NSA, okay? and then sold or given to the NSA for their use. Hacking Team is one of those companies that are in the world who create exploits, okay, and sell them to governments, including, you know, I think they, they're, they have a, a really big list of governments that they sell to. So they sell to the U.S. government, they sell to the, I think the FBI in the U.S., the U.S. Department of Defense, but they sell to Turkey and they sell to Oman and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Mexico and Russia. They're based out of Milan, uh, Italy. And so they, you know, they're a very profitable company. And I think a lot of people don't know that there are these companies out there that they're, what they do, they develop hacks, exploits, okay? <laughs> in, in the more, in the more, uh, uh, technical world, they're called exploits versus hacks, right? Yeah. So they develop malware that they sell to governments to spy on people, right? And hacking team is one of them. And they developed a lot of the Adobe Flash type exploits that a lot of governments use for spying on their opponents and their people. Uh, and they got hacked in 2015, a lot of their exploits got released in that 2015 hack. We don't really know who hacked them. Uh, a lot of people think it might have been the NSA who hacked them and then took all of their exploits and put them out on the uh, on the internet. And so some of these that you see in Metasploit came from hacking team, but there's a number of other companies out there who do this, like Vupen, they're in France. <laughs> Vupen is in France. Hacking team is in Italy. Italy. And there's a number of them in the US and throughout the world who develop these malware and then they sell it to governments. And some of these companies are making hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, we talk about hacking, we talk about careers in hacking. This is a very lucrative and legal form of hacking by developing these exploits and part of that process would be in many cases not always but in many cases is reverse engineering which we have this class coming up in a couple weeks or a week and a half or so from here so for those people who want to pursue a career that's going to put them in this kind of position where they can actually develop malware for governments and if that's something you want to do you know, this is this is a class you might want to participate in. So, super interesting, actually, exciting this one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's it's it's a career field that a lot of people don't know about. That you can actually make a very lucrative living developing these exploits. And you know, most people who are new to the field think that hacking is all done by criminal gangs, and a lot of it is but there's also a legitimate and legal field of developing hacks for governments. And so, and that pays very, very well. And hacking team is, in, is one, Bupen is another. 
there's a number of them in the United States, and they're almost all contractors and U.S. contractors to the CIA or to the NSA. But Metasploit is one of those tools that if you're starting out in hacking is a, is a really good tool to be able to experiment with, right? And there's, it's always being updated. There's always new exploits and new payloads being developed. And uh, you can use it with, uh, you know, a, a number of different systems. There's also, it's not just limited to Windows systems. You can use it on Linux systems and Apple systems. And so there's right. lots of possibilities here. Right, right. I agree. And I think, you know, I, I'm getting a lot of questions always. It's interesting for, for many that are coming into the cyber field. What tools? Okay, we, we understand now Linux, understand operating system in, in, you know, in high level, or we know how to code. What tools now can we use? And, and I think one in your book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker, you are, you are speaking about many efficient and effective uh, tools. I saw you did a great video with David Bombal. If you guys didn't see it, go search it uh, as well on the top 10 tools for 2024 by uh, Master Hacker Occupy the Web that also uh, gave some uh, new updates uh, on uh, these tools. I think we, we touched uh, Metasploit uh, a bit, definitely interesting. And if you are interested in more depth into such uh, videos or Metasploit itself or other tools, please leave uh, uh, your comments into the in the description. And I think you spoke about um, the malware development, the legal malware uh, industry. There is a lot of uh, lucrative uh, financial motivation behind uh, that. You know, the same is happening also with the uh, zero day uh, uh, vulnerabilities, right, that are being discovered and then sold in the black market either to criminals or to nation state by themselves. And that's right. also money uh, uh, there that not, not too many people are aware of speaking about. Yeah, there is a market. There is a black market for malware. And I think maybe more people are aware of the black market for malware. But a lot of people aren't aware that there is a legal and legitimate market for malware to governments. And so, and hacking team is a good example of it. And right. you know, there's a number of them that are out there. There's, if you, but this requires a really high level of skill set. It's, it's, you know, for, it's something to aspire to, you know, it's, it's not going to be, if you're using, you know, some of the basic tools, you're not going to, you know, get into hacking team or boot pen what you need to do is you need to develop high level skills and then once you're at that level the career possibilities are are, are really endless and very lucrative so and i i say that part because that's partly what we have coming up real soon with our reverse engineering course and if those people want to if people want to aspire to that kind that level of hacking that might be a course that you uh, want to get enrolled in we also have an exploit development course coming up uh, later in 2024 so these are the kind of skills that you need to be able to aspire to working on this level and making very good money right definitely very cool so with that said thanks so much uh, occupy the web as always it's insightful those of you that love the the video and following us please also follow hacker arise you you heard about the new exploitation reverse engineering malware uh, uh, courses that are coming uh, up don't forget to like and subscribe and until the next video See you.